House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on Wednesday she would be comfortable with Bernie Sanders as the Democratic presidential nominee for November. When asked the question by reporters in the House basement, she replied with one word, yes. Mm. So joining us now by Skype to weigh in on Pelosi and other Democrats warming up to the front runners, David Pakman. He's host of The David Pakman Show, great friend of our show. Good to see you, David. Great to see you, David. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So what did you make of that Pelosi moment, David? We, Crystal and I have basically been kicking around about how when you see establishment figures begin to signal or in some cases outright endorse Sanders or you know any progressive, that is a big power shift in the Democratic Party. What did you make of it? Yeah, so the, the cynical interpretation is they're seeing what's happening and they don't want to be on the outside having the door shut on them if Bernie is the nominee and if Bernie is the president. And there's no question that that's part of it. But I think the, the sort of non-trivial component to this is that there's a reasonable probability that Bernie Sanders will have the most pledged delegates going into the convention, but not 50% plus one. And therefore, there will be, you know, to call it a contested convention may not be the right term, but there will be a negotiated convention at minimum. Starting to see leaders like Pelosi and Schumer warm up to Bernie may be a signal that they won't try to negotiate Bernie out of the nomination at the DNC. And if indeed that would be as destructive to the uh, broader goal of defeating Donald Trump, which I, I think is the goal for most Democrats, that's actually really important because they may be starting to signal if Bernie has the most nominee uh, delegates, but not enough to clinch, we shouldn't try to put together Biden's and Buttigieg's and Klobuchar's to defeat Bernie because that could be bad. And that's why this is so important. Uh -huh. Yeah. And on the other hand, we're getting contradictory signals because the New York Times has reporting that we also talked about today where they interviewed a bunch of superdelegates and they were basically like, we're all in to try to take this from Bernie on the second ballot, even while acknowledging that it would be incredibly destructive to the party. They understand the damage that it could potentially do, but they're still, you know, telling the New York Times that at least that they're completely willing to go down that path. Um, what do you make of those sort of two contradictory signals? Yeah, well, so earlier this week, I did a commentary where, where I believe actually the if you want to take it from Bernie, the way to do it without the crushing repercussions of a second round where delegates just hand it to somebody else would be to negotiate it away from Bernie on the first round of voting. So that would be, again, if you imagine Biden, Klobuchar, Buttigieg together maybe add up to 50% plus one, negotiating that two of them direct their delegates to support somebody else. Because I think that would be, if you are the DNC, that's the less obviously destructive way to take it from Bernie. So uh, yes, there is a contradiction there, but it, it very well may not come to the superdelegates. Hmm. Well, that's a good scenario I didn't even really think about, but I guess it is entirely plausible. You're kind of seeing the groundwork for this late on cable news, right, David, where they, they put a graphic of like, well, if you add up six people together, then it's 51 and not the other. I do, I do think it would still, do you think it would cause the less amount of chaos than if the superdelegates did? Because, I mean, a steal is a steal or a negotiation, whatever is a negotiated solution. There's no question that mm. both have the potential to get Bernie voters to either stay home, some of them to vote for Trump as a percentage always will no matter what. But I, I do think if we're talking about two destructive actions, it's the less destructive one. You can make the case that there was consensus building, whereas if superdelegates just come in and say, we're all in for somebody else, it's more overtly anti-democratic. And to be clear, I'm not supporting either of these actions, right. but yeah. I do believe it's the less destructive way to, do, to take it from Bernie. Yeah. What do you make yeah. of how Elizabeth Warren is p playing all of this? I mean, she's previously come out very strongly against superdelegates. She's been very clear about saying, you know, the person with the most votes should win, et cetera. Now that it doesn't serve her interest, suddenly she's, you know, the, the process should play itself out. We accepted these rules. She made comments last night at a town, CNN town hall very much um, in that direction. What do you make of her development there? Well, everybody right now is supporting the scenario that most benefits them. So there's no, I mean, if you just apply basic self-interest, it tells us why each person is saying what they're saying. I believe at this point, Elizabeth Warren knows that unless something completely outside of what the polling suggests happens on Super Tuesday, she has no shot to the nomination. I believe at this point, what Elizabeth Warren, Warren wants is a strong negotiating position at the DNC. And it's conceivable that if she does okay on Super Tuesday, 
Tuesday and in what's left, just doing a basic math analysis, she may be able to, by directing her delegates to support Bernie, get Bernie to where he needs to be on the first ballot. It, it's not the most likely scenario, but it's possible. So she's leveraging for negotiating power of the convention right now. Yeah, that's I mean, certainly interesting. At the same time, we have Michael Bloomberg. Actually, David, it's funny. We're talking about the, de- the delegate math. There's basically been a turn on Bloomberg at this point where establishment figures now recognize he's essentially bleeding support from Joe Biden. And that if he had not, if he wasn't in the race, Biden would probably be winning uh, like dramatically in places like Florida or if in places like Texas. And one I saw where Bernie and Biden are actually tied right now. If Bloomberg was not in the race, Biden would be winning the state by almost six points. I mean, what do you make of this entire thing? It, it, it's, it's funny because he's essentially hurting the cause that he purports to support. Yeah. So if the goal is to get somebody other than Bernie to 50 percent plus one on on the first ballot in advance of the DNC, uh, then I don't actually think that the Bloomberg participation is that destructive to Biden, because I think either way, Biden does not have a likely path to 50 percent plus one, even even without Michael Bloomberg. If the goal is simply to get as many people, some delegates as possible simply to deny Bernie Sanders 50% plus one, then Bloomberg actually is doing a good job because it's not just Biden support that Bloomberg is taking. So in order to understand whether Bloomberg's presence does or doesn't make sense, you have to understand what is the, what's the goal? What's the motivation? And if it's merely to keep Bernie away from 50% plus one, Bloomberg is actually likely to help that with his uh, Super Tuesday delegates that he's likely to pick up. Wow. Very interesting stuff, David. Thank you so much. We always love having you. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Next on Rising, 43% of the U.S. eligible voting population did not vote in 2016. Will, will they in 2020? We're going to discuss when Rising continues. 